um, good to be here. There have been many episodes to um, Ike's journey, but tonight we're going to talk about one in particular. What is it? We're going to talk about addiction tonight and my experience with that and, um, and my experience with recovery. Yes. And so I brought a piece of art as a jumping off point and uh, as a reflection on um, this. I've uh, been preparing these for the Tangle Tour, as you know. Um, the piece behind you um, I'll re be referring to. Um, I don't have a name for this painting, but initially I did have a poem on it. Um, the painting itself is basically a self-portrait. Um, that's me in the front, that's or you symbol in the front. symbolizes me. Now let's, I'm gonna put this into context. You have brought a piece of painting to each one of our stops on the Tangle Tour. Right. And these, of course, uh, this was the first one, this was last week, mm -hmm. and now this one tonight. Right. Uh, tell us about it. Right. Um, the entire series is underneath um, the transome, if you will, of the phrase Salvator Ambulando, which is a Latin phrase that means there is salvation in walking or walking brings the solution um, or walking solves everything, however you want to say it. Uh, it's a phrase I came across. As you mentioned, I was uh, incarcerated. Uh, I spent from the age of 18 to 31 uh, in prison mm -hmm. minus about 17 months at the age of 21. Fast forward uh, the adjustment from federal incarceration. Of those years, I spent two and a half years in isolation. Um, all of this affected me in some sort of way, obviously. Um, fast forward to August 2nd, 2010, 2012. August 2nd, 2012 was the first time that I bought heroin. And so I want to ask this, this question. Yeah. Did your addiction began before you went to prison or jail? Well, I've come across uh, a couple of phrases uh, and some readings uh, and have um, been the beneficiary of different programs. Um, and um, one of the um, phrases that uh, definitely rings true for me is maladjusted from the beginning. <laughs> so I'm like, that resembles me, you know. Now, I, I You were maladjusted I from was, the beginning. Yes, yeah, so. From the, the beginning of what? From the beginning of my life. The character defects or the impulses uh, were there. Uh, the, the, the attributes of addiction were, were part of my DNA, are part of my DNA. So what do you mean that? attributes of addiction, uh, like let, what? Let me illustrate that for you. So it, in, in, in another phrase is a court low. A court low, a doctor, uh, they've uh, done studies and people who um, suffer from the disease of addiction have a lower dopamine, neuroepinephrine, serotonin level constantly. So. A lot of people in addiction, uh, when they get into recovery, will say something like, um, I always felt other than, or I just never felt right. There was, I was always needing to fix, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, drugs is what people turn to, or alcohol, for that temporary ease and comfort. Ultimately, you know, trying to adjust those things which are part of our DNA. The, uh, the court low issue, you know. Um, uh, I, I, I'm sure uh, there were some frontal lobe issues with me, impulse control stuff, you know, all of these things happening uh, as a young person, going uh, through um, the growing up process, um, the hormones that happen, all of this, just uh, the coalescence of these factors. Um, uh, I can illustrate this maladjustment from a young age with one very quick story. Um, I didn't do any drugs till really relatively late um, in my life. Uh, comparatively speaking, but I would always, as a young child, uh, eight, nine, seven, as far back as I can remember, would always be sneaking into the kitchen to get just one more. And for instance, I really loved hot dog buns. And I would, one bun at a time, go back and forth to the kitchen, sneaky style, and eat an entire 12 buns 
And when mom would go to fix the hot dogs, she'd be like, what happened to my This buns? is one of the great <laughs> mysteries of our family life, uh, now revealed and solved. And of course, the same uh, ice cream got the same treatment, cookies, you know, I was literally hand in the cookie jar all the time, you know, on top of the fridge there. Oh, sorry, mom. I'll go okay, back. so, so anyway. what you're saying is that uh, the addiction came later, but the attributes that made you an addict, you now see were very early in your life. Yes, they are a part of my life. In fact, you know, they're doing all kinds of new things with brain scanning these days and also stem cell research and, and just in general genetic research. And they're finding that there are all these genetic precursors for the disease of addiction. You know, now, like genetics, you're talking about me. <laughs> well, I've uh, always the, said uh, uh, that's where this conversation is no, going. No, the, the, the art came from my mom's side of the family. The crazy stuff came from his I'll side. See, you know? I see. I, now that's all of our interview tonight. Uh, I think we're out of time. I've been telling people for years. I come from a long line of preachers and jailers, and they're all all over in Eastern Kentucky, and they live on mountains, and, and they wear overalls, and they put ketchup on everything. You know? <laughs> anyway, that's. It. That's that side of the family. Yeah, that's another, that's another interview <laughs> yeah, yeah. right there. Sorry. Yeah. So now let's go back now to the story about heroin. You knew yeah. exactly the time and date. I know. The, so August 2nd, 2012. On August 2nd, I've learned, you know, um, to, to, to stay inside on August 2nd. Because in my life, and I'm 47, I've been arrested on five different August 2nds in really? my life. In five separate years, five different August 2nds, but August 2nd, arrest, arrest, arrest. Is that crazy? You that couldn't is even crazy. plan that. I know. So that happened. Yeah. So the August the 2nd. 2012. 12, tell us about that one. That was both heroin uh, and an arrest on the same day? It was, was a, a setup. <laughs> it was a setup. It was. Uh, so somebody who I was having an interaction with in order to make this poor decision, this person was enabling that poor decision by setting, setting up the, the, the buy. And Were you alone with this person? I was alone with this person. He, he was a friend of mine. Uh, he's no longer with us. He died three years later. Um, but he was actually a writer, a guy. He wrote three books. He was a genius, uh, uh, but also untreated mental illness, schizophrenia, as well as um, addiction issues, probably you know self-medicating in a lot of cases with him. But, um, he took me to the dealer. I got a very small amount of heroin. Of heroin, two little packs. I think I spent twenty-five dollars, and then I also got some for the guy who took me there. We left. We got to a stop sign a block away, and my door opens up. Now I had them in my mouth to hide them because if you're driving, you know, you put them in your mouth for safety, right? They were in aluminum foil. I look, and this guy. I literally get punched in the jaw. You were driving the car. I was in the passenger seat. The door opens up, I am shocked, I get punched, and, and, and one of the things flies out of my mouth into the back seat, I'm aware of it, so I'm lurching in the back, and this person who I don't know is a police officer is literally trying to choke me. Um, I wake up, I, uh, the last thing I remember is reaching for this thing. What thing? This, this drug that had fallen out of my mouth, because I had them both in my mouth. So the, the next thing, I wake up on the hot August asphalt, cuffed with a guy and a knee in my back. I, I was awakened by the pain being caused by the strawberry being put on my face by the police officer. He picked my face up and strawberried the other side. And then the other officer walking by said something to the effect of, um, something about a bank robbery or whatever, which then I began to piece together as my friend who was driving and clearly having committed the felony with me was walking by talking with the police officer and he's like, sorry, Ike. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, okay, I, mean, I get they, it now. They were after you, they weren't not after him. They, he set me up, yeah, because he had already had a previous run into him. He said, oh, I know this guy, he's an he's a ex-bank robber. And, He'll, uh, you know, da 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 da. And so he called it in and they, they arrested me and I got, uh, uh, ended up um, being um, put in jail. And I, this, is the, this is the really degrading part of that whole thing. It's not, well, I'm, I don't have any grudge against the police officers. I probably would have roughed me up too, you know, but who knows? The, I, I didn't tell you that they did those things to me because I've got a bone to pick with them. I don't. You know, like uh, police officers are hardworking people and they're overworked and underpaid. 
just like uh, the rest of the justice um, system, as your previous um, uh, interview uh, talked about. Um, what happened when I got to the jail, the thing is they only got one of those things from me. So the other one was still in my mouth and I had swallowed it. I get into the jail, I asked, and this is while I'm still in booking, the only thing I can think of is this thing that's in my stomach. It's in aluminum foil. I asked them to put me in an isolation cell. They do, because you know, sometimes people need to be separated. So there's this in booking, they have an isolation cell. They put me over there. I make myself, I purge this out of myself and I, I find it. I open it up and off the backside of the toilet, I snort this drug, heroin. And my brain, my maladjusted, disease of addiction brain, completely unaware of what's happening to me or it or whatever, registered a success, despite clearly being in the midst of a major failure. <laughs> Arrested again, you know, after years of incarceration. It was the addictive side of you that registered the success. Does it, it's, 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 it's the primitive brain that registered, it's, it's the amygdala, it's the, it's the part of your brain that, um, that registered the success is, is the same part that, that, that ranks when you're in addiction, ranks drugs above food, ranks drugs above family, ranks drugs above anything other. Getting the next one is the only thing. It got so bad for me, I, if I may just give you this statistic. I came to one winter, 2018. Okay, but uh, go ahead. You're, you're jumping from being on heroin in a cell. Yes, right. In 2012. 2012. You, we're going to leave that behind we're, a minute, leave and it we're going somewhere else. Well, do you recall in 2014 getting a call from um, Good Samaritan Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky? Yes, the surgeon called me. The, right. the surgeon himself called me. We were at home. It was about noon. Yeah. And he said to me, your son is here. If we don't operate right now, he's going to die. Yeah. Yeah, I've never even asked you about that. Jan and I got in the car and drove down there to Good Sam. Mm -hmm. He wanted our permission, I guess, I don't know. Mm -hmm. He wanted us to be there, I guess, I don't know. I recall vividly seeing mom, you and mom come in. What had happened was what they call as a pneumoperitoneum. As a result of doing a shot of heroin with fentanyl in it, I never felt it come on. I dropped like a sack of potatoes in, my, in, my, in this person's living room and they called 911. This was before they had nasal Narcan, which reverses the effects of opiates. The EMTs got there. I don't, of course, I'm completely overdosed and turning blue. They've been giving me, my friend was giving me CPR, et cetera. The EMTs got there and they gave me not one, but two doses intravenously of Narcan. And it hit me so hard, it reversed the effects of those opiates so instantly. That is, it was a double dose. Because I weigh, you know, I was large. He, they have to use their judgment in a situation like this. How long's he been out? How much did he do? You know, how long's he been using, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he measured out some and gave it to me. And I came to so violently. I retched so forcefully that my core muscles literally ripped my yeah. stomach open. And that's called a pneumoperitoneum. I think that's what the surgeon was calling you was about. talking about, yeah. that, that you were so torn up on the inside right. that if he didn't do something immediately. Yeah, I mean, my stomach was wide open, yeah. stomach juices, everything falling into my, 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 my chest cavity. Of course, we didn't know all of this at the time. Well, and of course I didn't either. You didn't know it either. I was eight days in the hospital and I left with 75 staples yeah. in my stomach. Yeah, it looked and like an open heart surgery. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, so that was my second overdose and the beginning of me realizing I'm gonna die. I didn't even think about quitting, but I mean, maybe I did, who knows? I can't say exactly what I thought, but I know this. By January 2015, just six months later, I had checked into the, the Healing Place, a wonderful program in Louisville, Kentucky, um, that's been serving the community for 25 years and saving lives for free. 
I walked in there and I stayed for four months, four of the best months of my life. And that was the first time I really tried to get clean. First time I, I was exposed to the ideas and the concepts of the disease of addiction, AA, NA, Narcotics Anonymous, the Alcohol steps. Anonymous, the 12 steps, and like that there is a solution. And I knew it would work. Intellectually, I understood. I said, I'm, I can do this. This is because it's about emptying out all the crap in the, in the mind, which in my paintings, the birds are symbols for memory and hope or the past and the future. And in my experience, and, and, and a lot of that would be trauma, not all for me, for instance, but but the things that drive us in addiction, you know, they say you're going you're gonna to have to put more on it. You know, if you do something compromising to your own personal soul and integrity, the only way to deal with that as a person, for instance, if you sell your body for drugs, how are you going to live with that? Well, the only way to live with that is to put more drugs on it because otherwise it just begins to weigh too much and a person might just choose to cancel their subscription. So in 2012, right. this episode with heroin. Right. In 2015, the episode at Good Sam Hospital that Correct. we remember. Yep. And Six then, months later, you went in. This was your first trip through, through rehab. No, I won't say that. It wasn't my first trip through rehab. It was the first time I ever took rehab seriously. You guys sent me to rehab when I was 18 for smoking weed. Yeah, I remember. You remember. So I That's would, another whole story, yeah. another whole <laughs> interview. <laughs> that's a different thing. So, but, but from the fi uh, 2015, that's mm -hmm. eight years ago now. And then and, I wake up in 2018, the winter of 2018. It was the end of November or beginning of December. I woke up again in the U of L emergency room. And um, I know I've got all the nurses on uh, uh, first name basis. Yeah. And I ask one of them during a conversation, how many times have I been here this year? And she left and came back and, and she could hardly make eye contact with me. She said, Ike, this is your 20th time you've been here this year. In that one, one hospital? One year, one year, one emergency room. 20 times on an ambulance to an emergency room. That's how close to being not here I was. Was that the bottom? Well, you know, the bottom keeps dropping. <laughs> so, but I will say that that is, I had a moment of clarity at that point. And while nothing happened instantly, it was the beginning of a five year effort to get to where I, where I am now, which is stable, clean, happy even and productive productive and hopeful uh, full of hope and my life is awesome yeah the artwork has really been fabulous it's been great uh, to, to to go on this journey with you for yeah. you to come with me yeah man on this tangle tour mm -hmm. to learn stuff i've never heard before yeah. to hear you articulate things that i've never heard you say yeah. and to do so in the context of this great art um, our intention, of course, is to have an exhibit uh, when it's over to publish a book mm -hmm. uh, and uh, put your story in print. Uh, I hope it sells better than my books <laughs> in print. Well, you know, you've always been such an inspiration to me. And I, when, anytime I, I, I introduce myself to people, I tell them I'm, I'm the middle son of a Southern Baptist preacher. and. Um, you know, I'm always so proud to show you off, and it's been so wonderful to be on this trip with you and just to be able to participate in, in making the plans and troubleshooting things. Uh, but it's gone so smoothly and so nice, and I'm so happy to be here today. And I know we've got one more dinner in Hendersonville, and it's going to be awesome because we're going to have all the paintings hung. Yep. I'm going to present one more painting, and from there, I'll be uh, headed, out, headed west out west to Bisbee, uh, Bisbee Arizona, Arizona, to study with, and it's a dream come true for me, to study with this artist whose name I, I, I will reserve, but uh, is a friend I've had for, for 10 or 15 years. And um, he has a 65 acre ranch out there in the Chiricahua Mountains. When I return, and this is the best news of all, when I return after the first of the year, I begin teaching three times a month 
at the SAP program, which is the substance abuse program, I begin teaching art to the state inmates three times a month. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations to you. Yeah. That's a great place to end. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Ike, for being in the meeting house again. Uh, we've got one more visit in the meeting house That's next right. week. Yep. God bless you. Let's make it good. Yeah, man. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of you for hanging in there, for sticking hanging around. In. Yeah. Good night to everybody. <laughs>